Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is valvular heart disease. In this video, I will describe the cardiac effects of valvular stenosis and insufficiency and analyze the causes of these processes and their associated morphologic findings. Now, when we talk about valvular heart disease, we are talking about two processes, stenosis and insufficiency. Stenosis is the failure of a valve to open fully, which was going to cause an obstruction of forward flow. Now, this can be due to things such as a primary leaflet abnormality, such as a bicuspid aortic valve, or a chronic process, such as calcification or scarring. Because we have this narrowed orifice, this is going to cause a pressure overload as the muscle pushes against that narrowed orifice. This is going to lead to cardiac hypertrophy. Also, with this narrowed opening and this increased pressure, we can get jets of blood that may injure endothelium or endocardium, and as you recall, injured endothelium is procoagulant and could set you up for a thrombus. We can also get insufficiency, which is failure of a valve to close fully, and in this case, we're going to get regurgitation or backflow of blood. This can be due to intrinsic disease of the valve leaflets, such as endocarditis, or through disruption of supporting structures, such as the mitral annulus or aorta. And this may be abrupt in onset, for example, papillary muscle rupture following a myocardial infarction, or slow and insidious, such as rheumatic mitral stenosis. And what we are going to see here is going to be a volume overload in contrast to the pressure overload we see in stenosis. So let's look at the cardiac consequences here. So if we have aortic valve stenosis, then we're going to get increased pressure in the left ventricle, which is going to lead to concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And over time, as this becomes more narrowed, the chamber will become small, and this is going to result in left atrial dilation since the atrium will not be able to empty fully. Uh, if we have mitral valve stenosis, uh, we're going to have uh, increased left atrial pressure, which is going to lead to left atrial dilation. Now, when we start talking about regurgitation with aortic valve regurgitation, we're going to get blood from the aorta back flowing into the left ventricle, leading to a volume overload, which will cause left ventricular dilation and then compensatory eccentric hypertrophy. With mitral valve regurgitation, we're going to get uh, volume overload of the left atrium as blood from the left ventricle flows back into the left atrium. And again, this can lead to left atrial dilation. Now, I wish I could show you an image of what all of these look like, but what I'm going to show you is an example of stenosis and regurgitation. So here we can see in aortic stenosis, we have here uh, a calcified aortic valve, and you can appreciate this Im Im very impressive uh, left concentric hypertrophy. And you can see how uh, small uh, the left ventricular chamber is, which is why the left atrium cannot empty, leading to left atrial dilation. Now remember, whenever you have this situation, you are uh, creating areas of stasis, uh, and you can also end up with an arrhythmia leading to atrial fibrillation. And both of these are a setup uh, for the formation of neural thrombi and then embolization. In mitral valve prolapse, which you can see here, recognized by this hooding of the mitral valve leaflet, you can see here that while the left ventricle is perhaps mildly hypertrophic, the predominant finding here is going to be this left atrial dilation with all of the uh, clinical consequences I mentioned uh, for this scenario. So let's now look at the um, causes of stenosis uh, and insufficiency in our aortic and mitral valves. So this comes from a table in Robbins that I've broken down in this way. So really the only uh, acquired cause of uh, mitral valve uh, stenosis is going to be post-inflammatory scarring secondary to rheumatic heart disease. Now we can see that also as a cause for aortic valve stenosis. More commonly, uh, stenosis in the aortic valve will be uh, age-related calcific aortic stenosis or calcification of a congenitally deformed, for example, bicuspid valve. Now, as we start talking about uh, insufficiency with mitral valve regurgitation, this can be due to abnormalities of leaflets and commissures, in which case, again, we consider uh, post-inflammatory scarring, mitral valve prolapse, which I'll discuss a little later in this video, and fen-fen fibrosis, which is quite uncommon in the United States these days. We can also get abnormalities of the tensor apparatus, such as uh, papillary muscle rupture or dysfunction, which we can see uh, following uh, myocardial infarction, uh, as well as cord rupture. And then we can get abnormalities of the left ventricular cavity or annulus, such as uh, secondary to left ventricular enlargement due to myocarditis or dilated cardiomyopathy, or calcification of the mitral ring. 
When we consider aortic valve regurgitation, again, post-inflammatory scarring comes in, but we also need to consider infective endocarditis, which can cause destruction of the aortic valves. And then finally, we have a variety of different aortic diseases that can lead to regurgitation, such as degenerative aortic dilation, syphilitic aortitis, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Marfan syndrome. And in these sorts of diseases, we have dilation of the uh, aortic annulus, which is going to make that aortic valve uh, uh, regurgitant. So I've mentioned uh, post-inflammatory scarring multiple times. That is rheumatic heart disease, so let's focus on that for a moment. So uh, rheumatic heart disease, uh, as you will recall, is an immunologically mediated multi-system inflammatory disease after group A beta hemolytic streptococcal uh, infections. Uh, now, the incidence of rheumatic heart disease is significantly decreased over the recent decades in higher income countries due to rapid diagnosis and treatment of strep, uh, decreased virulence of organisms, and improved, improved socioeconomic factors. So you may be thinking, well, why do I need to learn about rheumatic heart disease? And the truth of the matter is, is that in lower income countries, it is a significant cause of acquired valve disease in children and young adults. And due to patterns of migration, this is something we need to be aware of. So how is a diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever made? As you may recall, we use the Jones criteria, where you need to have either two of the major criteria, or one major and two minor criteria, plus evidence of a recent group A streptococcus infection. Now, what we primarily will see uh, in children is pancarditis. Uh, adults more commonly will present with polyarthritis. So what are the uh, cardiac findings in acute rheumatic fever? We will get uh, valvular inflammation, which is uh, manifested by fibrinoid necrosis and fibrin deposition along valvular lines of closure. And these create minute one to two millimeter vegetations called verruci. And this is covered uh, in the uh, video on uh, uh, valvular vegetations. Uh, the mitral valve alone is involved in about two thirds of cases, uh, mitral and aortic in a quarter of cases. Another uh, histologic finding we will have is Ashoff bodies, uh, which are composed of T cells, plasma cells, and activated macrophages. These activated uh, macrophages have a particular appearance and are referred to as Anichkow cells. We can also see associated fibrinoid necrosis. And then uh, another finding that we can see grossly and microscopically is fibrinoid, uh, fibrinous uh, pericarditis. And let's take a look at that first. This should be a reminder for you from the patterns of inflammation video uh, earlier in the series, where we can appreciate here this fibrinous pericarditis and see the histologic image here with uh, fibrin deposition uh, here with the pericardium and underlying muscle. But taking us to something more specific uh, for uh, rheumatic uh, heart disease, here is an Ashoff body. So this is pathognomonic for your uh, acute rheumatic fever. And you can see here that we have these activated macrophages uh, as well as these uh, sort of caterpillar cells. And I have a better image uh, to show you in the next slide. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Uh, these are our Anichkow cells, which uh, look like a little fuzzy caterpillar here in the middle, uh, lengthwise. And here you can see some very uh, reactive and activated macrophages. So how do we get acute rheumatic fever? Uh, and what is the pathogenesis of these findings? So about two to three weeks after a streptococcal infection, we will get cross-reaction uh, of CD4 positive T cells and antibodies to streptococcal M proteins with host myocardial and valvular proteins. When we get this cross reaction, we're going to get activation of complement and recruitment of FC receptor bearing cells such as neutrophils and macrophages. We're also going to bring in our activated T cells and all of these inflammatory cells will begin elaborating cytokines. This is going to uh, activate our macrophages leading to our Ashoff bodies and all of this, um, these cytokines and these inflammatory cells are going to result in significant acute inflammation, which, as you know, can lead to scarring. So what are the uh, morphologic features of uh, rheumatic fever or, or uh, acute uh, rheumatic uh, cardiac disease? Grossly, we will see leaflet uh, thickening, uh, as well as commissure of fusion, which is called a fish mouth stenosis. This is going to lead, as you would imagine, to left atrial dilation. We can also get shortening, thickening, and fusion of the tendinous cords, which could uh, um, sort of ironically lead us to uh, regurgitation.
Uh, microscopically, uh, we can see scar or fibrosis. But really, the most important finding uh, is going to be uh, our gross findings. So here we can see the fish mouth stenosis of the mitral valve with commissural uh, fusion. If you see this image, you know that this person has had rheumatic heart disease. And then this is an image that I also show in the uh, valve vegetations video. Uh, we know that we have chronic uh, rheumatic heart disease going on here because we can see these thickened uh, cordae. And also we can see thickening of the valve leaflet. The actual verruci are acute and are these tiny one to two millimeter growths on the edge. Uh, and what can happen is once you've already had uh, rheumatic heart disease with that uh, molecular mimicry and that cross-reactivity, a subsequent infection uh, can cause additional damage. So this is an individual who already had uh, rheumatic heart disease and then got a second group A streptococcus infection leading to an acute on chronic uh, picture. And here you can see a uh, resected aortic valve with uh, really uh, amazing thickening here. And then you have this opening here. So you can actually have stenosis, but blood can also flow back across there since it doesn't close appropriately. So the next uh, condition I'd like to talk about as far as valvular disease goes is valvular degeneration. So why do we see degeneration of our valves? Well, there are high levels of repetitive mechanical stress, particularly at the hinge points. This is because we have millions of cardiac contractions every year with substantial tissue deformations during each contraction with high transvalvular pressure gradients. So what this can cause is calcification, which may be of the cusps or of the uh, annulus. And we can get extracellular matrix changes, such as uh, myxomatous change, which is increased proteoglycan and decreased fibrillar collagen and elastin. Or we can see fibrosis and scarring. Now, valvular degeneration may be clinically silent and only identified on imaging or autopsy, or it may be symptomatic. Now, the most important of these is going to be calcific aortic stenosis, which is fairly common. We see it in anatomically uh, normal individuals in the 7th to 9th decades. For individuals who have a congenital bicuspid aortic valve, they will present one to two decades earlier because of abnormalities in flow. All of the risk factors are risk factors associated with atherosclerosis, such as male sex, high low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, hypertension, and smoking. And what happens is we get accumulated lipoproteins, which lead to inflammation. This, combined with flow abnormalities, such as in a bicuspid valve or hypertension, will lead to endothelial cell injury. And when we have endothelial cell injury, we can get uh, additional uh, atherosclerosis. So what we'll see morphologically will be heaped up masses on the outflow side of the cusps that can protrude into the sinuses of Valsalva and mechanically impede valve opening. So here we have two examples, this one in a healthy uh, tricuspid uh, aortic valve, where you can see here uh, these mounds of uh, calcification. And this is in a congenitally bicuspid aortic valve. Here is the fusion, and you can see a mound of calcium here. And again, I showed you this image earlier, but I'll show you again. This is that uh, heart with calcific uh, aortic valve stenosis, leading to that pressure gradient, uh, left ventricular concentric hypertrophy, and then dilation of our left atrium. So for the clinical features of aortic stenosis, uh, the normal area of the aortic uh, orifice is four centimeters squared. With obstruction, we will get to orifice narrowing, and we consider severe stenosis to be 0.5 to 1 centimeter squared. You'll be able to detect a murmur, which is a mid-systolic crescendo decrescendo, uh, which you can hear at the right second intercostal space and which radiates to the right neck and carotid artery. Because of this uh, pressure gradient across the valve, as I've already shown you, we will get a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And untreated, most patients with aortic stenosis will die within five years of developing angina. And treatment is surgical valve replacement. This brings us to the last uh, condition I'd like to discuss, which is mitral valve prolapse. So in mitral valve prolapse, one or both mitral valves are floppy and will protrude into the left atrium during systole. It's uh, fairly common, about 0.5 to 2.4% of adults, and tends to affect females. Uh, most cases are idiopathic, although there are some uh, familial cases that are associated with connective tissue disorders, such as Marfan syndrome. And what we will see grossly is hooding or doming of the uh, valve leaflets. We can also see fibrous thickening of the valve leaflets or at the impact point with the endocardium. 
And actually, we can get thrombi forming here as well. Microscopically, we'll see myxomatous degeneration. Now, because of this re, uh, regurgitation, we're going to get volume overload of the left ventricle, which can lead to pulmonary hypertension and left atrial enlargement. So our clinical features are that the majority of individuals will be asymptomatic. Uh, you'll be able to recognize them because of a mid-systolic click, which is due to abrupt tension on the redundant cord's closure. Uh, they also will have a regurgitant murmur. Now, about 3 to 4% of individuals develop complications, uh, such as infective endocarditis. Keep in mind that the uh, typical endocardium is resistant to colonization by bacteria, but when you have uh, abnormalities, this can be a setup uh, for infection. Uh, they can also get mitral insufficiency, and due to uh, the dilation that we can see uh, of the uh, left atrium, we can get emboli, which lead to stroke or infarct, and arrhythmias. And again, here is that image showing that doming of the mitral valve uh, and this uh, dilation of the left atrium, uh, which uh, is your setup for uh, mural thrombi. And of course, with uh, this uh, dilation, we can get a backup of pressure into the lungs as well. Uh, here are some uh, additional gross images. Here you can see uh, there's um, these little fibrous patches which actually have some thrombi on them. This is where the, uh, the mitral valve is hitting uh, the endocardium. And then this is just another example showing that hooding and doming uh, of the mitral valve. Then what we see microscopically for comparison here is a healthy mitral valve. In a mitral valve prolapse, we have this uh, breakdown of our proteoglycans. They're no longer uh, well uh, organized, and this is referred to as uh, medial degeneration. So as always, here are some questions to help you review the material I've just covered. I hope you have found this useful. Thank you for your time and attention.